Welcome to Elder Care Illuminated, Torchlight's caregiving podcast. Elder Care Illuminated addresses the ins and outs and ups and downs of caring for your loved ones. Join us for interesting conversations with elder care specialists, geriatric care managers, attorneys, and ordinary people with extraordinary caregiving experiences. Everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this special edition of our podcast brought to you by Torchlight, which sponsors both our exceptional parenting podcast hosted by me, Stephanie Boucher, and the Elder Illuminated podcast hosted by my friend and colleague, Lenore Tracy. Hi, Lenore. Hello, Stephanie. Thank you well, for having me. I'm so happy to have you. I really love it when we get to do podcasts together. Glad you're here. It's amazing. The concerns of caregiving cross a lot of boundaries when it gets right down to it. Well, the reason that we're here together today, instead of going off to do our own podcasts, uh, is that we're going to be discussing a topic that impacts very deeply, I might add. Um, And as Lenore noted, every person I've ever met, and of course, those I haven't met. uh, And that topic is sleep. Humans are designed, of course, to spend a third or more of our lives sleeping, yet few of us in our culture do because it's hard to come by for all kinds of reasons. Um, And guess what? Too little sleep is not a good thing, as many of us know, Um, and of course, according to today's guest. So if it's you that isn't sleeping well, a spouse or partner that isn't sleeping well, or someone you are caring for that isn't sleeping well, uh, whether that individual is 8 or 80. We want to offer you some insight and provide tips on how to get a better night's sleep. We are here with clinical sleep educator and behavioral therapist Rick Clarice, who is the founder of Clear Mind Systems. Uh, Rick conducts sleep and wellness programs and gives talks in corporate settings and universities around the country. And he also conducts individual sleep coaching through Clear Mind Systems. Rick, welcome to the show. We are so thrilled to have you here today. Thanks, Stephanie and Lona. Nice to see you both. Very nice to see you as well. I've been very eager to have this conversation with you because I can't think of a single person that I know who doesn't complain about the sleep they're getting in some way, or rather the sleep that they're not getting. And in fact, sleep has become a much bigger topic, both in the media and in medical and public health communities over the past few years than it seemed to be in the past. Yet sleep has always been important. Why do you think that we are talking about it much more frequently now? Maybe it's becoming much more evident. You know, I think we valued sleep in the past. I think our ancestors valued sleep as much as they didn't have a lot of science around. We, uh, you know, we know more about sleep than we've ever known. The science is great. Sleep medicine is a very accurate science. Uh, It's done a lot of work over the past 50 years, and yet we've never slept as badly as we have, as far as we know, looking back into the past. And so perhaps it's just gotten so bad but finally, we have to talk about this. Yeah, and that kind of brings me to what I was going to ask you next. We know there are a number of large national studies that have surveyed Americans about our sleep practices. What do they tell us about Americans and sleep? There are some amazing figures, actually. About 70% of Americans report that they struggle with their sleep nearly every night. 30% of American workers say that they sleep six hours or less. Only 18% of teenagers are getting the optimum amount of sleep, and children between 3 and 11 are getting somewhere between two to two and a half hours less sleep per night than recommended. So sleep is across the board not happening for us. Wow. Does the quality of the sleep that we're getting differ by age? I mean, you mentioned the little ones getting two to two and a half hours less sleep than they really need. Who is experiencing the largest sleep deficiencies and why is this happening? Well, it's mostly kids and teenagers who are having, actually having the most problems. Adults are having problems also, but not quite as bad. Maybe it's because we were brought up in eras in which sleep was valued more and regulated more. Uh, we also maybe grew up in eras, as we found out today, as we played with our devices and our technology that we weren't as intruded upon by in technology as uh, young people are today. So amazingly enough, even though sleep is generally easier for young kids and teenagers, actually they are the ones suffering the most. 
And this is during developmental periods of time when sleep is even, in a way, more important. I'd like to talk a little bit about how our sleep culture has changed and what types of things are keeping us awake at night. And you're mentioning kids here, and I can tell you just through observation, because I have two adolescent children and and watching them sort of grow up in this era, there are so many more distractions electronically to keep them awake, right? I mean, I don't like to let my kids be on their phones super late at night, but I hear from them that they have classmates that are up until one, two, three, even sometimes four o'clock in the morning texting each other um, on social media, that type of thing. And I'm not really sure at what age that's starting, but clearly that's playing a role. Also, there are simply more ways to entertain yourself late at night than there used to be. I, you know, I know yeah. when I was growing up, there was really nothing worth watching on television, for example, past 11 o'clock for most young people. But now, of course, you have on-demand entertainment at any time of day or night that you could want. And it's very, very entertaining. So what are your thoughts on the things that are keeping our, our kids and our teens awake and maybe how we can mitigate that? You bet. Well, part of it is, you know, smartphones are really, they've entered into our lives, uh, become central to almost everything from bill paying to social media to learning now. Uh, 68% of kids bring their phones into the bedroom at night and a third of them keep them in their bed throughout the night. It is really disturbing. There was a study done at Harvard Medical School on the, the effects of smartphones on kids. It was actually done with adolescents. One group who spent the night in uh, sleep labs, so individual sleep labs, where we measure absolutely everything about the body from O2 levels to uh, brain waves, uh, exactly what stage of sleep, everything. It's just amazing. Uh, and then another group who slept in another wing in their sleep labs, one group had a smartphone on their nightstand, though they did not make or take a call. They slept 50% more fragmented sleep than the group who did not have a phone at all in the room. Just the presence of the phone, not even using it, made them stay up in stage one transitional sleep. That's a stage of sleep that should comprise about 5% of the night. And they were spending sometimes as much as half of the night in this stage of sleep that's almost valueless, other than it transitions us from wake to sleep, but it doesn't do a lot for health and regulation of various functions. So just the presence of the phone because it's a window on the rest of the world and actually doesn't remind us about anything concerning sleep was enough to keep them in very valueless sleep. Why is that? Is it because of the unconscious knowledge that the phone is there and you might be missing something or it's not because of say the the EMFs or the electromagnetic waves that are coming off of the phone? The research is called it threat expectancy and we use that term in psychology, but I, I often think it's really more connectivity expectancy. That, that expectancy that you will be connected with. Right. So probably better than to have a real alarm clock than to rely on your phone by your bed. <laughs> Absolutely. A battery-powered alarm clock that you have to actually push a button to even see what time it is. Those are what I always recommend to my clients. You know, they cost about $10. They're nice and cheap. They really work. And it helps a person get the phone out of the bedroom. I, I tell people, just get your phone out of the bedroom. So many people who I'm coaching Well, they resist it, of course, because they can't imagine not having the phone. But when they do it, they'll often say the next week that I talk to them, I hate to admit it, but I had much better sleep just for that one change. Yeah, I I admit that I'm guilty of that. I was just telling Lenore the other day, I don't own a real alarm clock anymore because I do rely on my phone. I put it in airplane mode while I sleep so that it can't and none of the notifications can bother me. But one of the reasons I like it is because uh, in the past, having that alarm clock with the, you know, the neon light blaring towards my face all night um, was interfering with my ability to fall asleep. And then of course, um, if I happen to wake up and the night. I don't necessarily like knowing what time it is when I wake up in the night because that can cause thinking, right? Like you wake up and it's 3 a.m. and if you can't fall back asleep for a few minutes, you're thinking, oh, it's 3.30. I'm losing sleep. I'm losing sleep. And I'd rather just not know what time it is. That's why the battery powered alarm clocks have that ability to be black. You know, you have to press a button in order to see what time it is so they don't shed any light. 
they're also not plugged in, so there aren't EMFs. You know, we often talk about um, the ideal situation for sleeping. So we tell people, keep a bedroom nice and clear and clean, no electronic things, no televisions, uh, don't even have piles of books that are half read, because those things make us feel unfinished. They make us think about things other than sleep. Sleep is such a, a wonderful and magical and natural state that actually if we just allow it to happen without other things getting in the way, it really does. It works beautifully when we don't interrupt it. But the minute you look at a screen, you know, the things about these phones is, first of all, they're not really phones. These are computers. And that window is a window on the rest of your world, your bills, your work, your people, your friends, your enemies, your debtors, <laughs> you name it. They are through that wind, everything but sleep. And so that word association, we always want to say, the minute you step over the threshold of your bedroom, you should associate that room with either sleep or intimacy, not everything else in the world. And the phone, just by its presence, reminds you of everything else in the world that can initiate thoughts and thinking. That's really great advice. And you have some great suggestions. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic, because it seems to me, of course, it's a very stressful time for most people and sleep might be especially difficult to come by now in, in times of stress. Have you Definitely. noticed a difference in the way people are sleeping uh, oh, in 2020? <laughs> you know, one, one of the neat things about my job is, you know, I do presentations, educational presentations for about 70 different uh, companies and places like Harvard and MIT and Tufts. And so that's kind of giving a presentation somewhat like this is. But when I do sleep coaching on the phone, I do that every single day with numerous people for a half an hour at a time. And so it's like I have my finger in the wind. I know exactly what's going on in relationship to the things in our world. And I see them in real time, how they affect people. So a few things that are affecting people given the pandemic, is enormous amounts of stress. And, and one of the worst stressors is uncertainty. And this has caused uncertainty in every area of our life, from going shopping to driving down the street and seeing people with masks that might upset you or not having masks that might upset you also. You, you grab an, a doorknob and you wonder if you should be. This has made us uncertain about the most basic things in life and even our loved ones and friends. And so uncertainty is a huge stressor, and it's been going on for about 10 months. We're not dealing with it terribly well because it's a new kind of challenge in a way. And so what I notice in people is that their stress levels are rising, 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 and everything else in their life takes place on top of this enormous baseline level of stress. And people are not learning how to release it because I think we've almost become accustomed to it. The other problem is that it's changed the way we schedule right. things. And so we often say to people, you know, sleep is a, it's a kind of a scientific chemical process, natural. I often say in my household, I'm a cook. My wife is the baker. Cooks can do anything they want. In midstream, I can decide on black beans rather than kidney beans. Or, you know, I can create a sauce or let it be dry. But baking is very specific. If it says let it rise for two hours, that means two hours, not an hour and 40 minutes. If it says cook it in a 300-degree oven for one hour and five minutes, you need to be exact or else it's ruined. Sleep is kind of like baking. It's really exact. So one of the things we say about sleep timing is sleep really loves same time in bed at night, same time in, out of bed in the morning. It really loves and thrives on that. It will endure a little bit of swaying and, you know, changing that schedule, but not a lot. And some people's sleep doesn't really allow for any. So what I'm noticing with people is, let's say, for an example, a person would tell me, you know, 10 months ago when I went to work every day, I would get up at six in the morning because I had to dress and change and shower, have some breakfast, do things for the kids. Then I had a 45 minute commute and all that would get me to work in time. And then at night, I would go to bed around 10, which, by the way, is perfect, 6 and 10. That's 16 hours. That's how long it takes to build the drive to sleep so that it's compelling. And so they would say, that's how I, I did it before. And my sleep was okay, like everybody else, <laughs> which really means terrible. But <laughs> And so they say, but now, and so I'd say, well, when do you get up now? Well, actually, I don't really have to get up until 730. I always found 6 kind of early for my 
own internal clock. So now I get up at 7.30. I still have plenty of time to do things. And at night, I mean, I, don't, I used, to, used to go to bed at 10, so I still go to bed at 10. But I have a terrible time getting to sleep. And, I, and, I've, and I've kind of already given you the answer. It takes 16 hours to build the drive to sleep. Now you get up at 7.30. You need to go to bed at 11.30. Even though 10 kind of fit with your husband or your wife and your kids, and it's kind of the way you liked to go to bed, and that was a good time for you. But now it's an hour and a half too early. And so you go to bed, you're maybe tired, but not really sleepy. You get restless, you, you fall asleep for seconds at a time, then you begin to get concerned about it, and then you call me, your sleep coach, and you say, my God, I can't go to sleep at night. And so sometimes it's as simple as that. So I help a person decide, so maybe you should continue getting up at six. Maybe you're going to go back to work pretty soon. And so you want to be back on the old schedule because it really did work for you. Or if you're going to continue getting up at 7.30, you really need to wait till 11 until your sleep drive is compellingly sleepy. And it's funny, the minute we change that for an awful lot of people, it's a huge difference and immediate too, that night. That certainly is the case for me. Going to bed early has never worked well. It's the case for me that when I go to bed early, I end up being awake even longer than if I had just gone to bed at my normal time. Um, So I get less sleep. So that's a great point. Why is it so important that we address our sleep deficiencies? Uh, What are some of the more significant effects of chronic sleep deprivation? Well, you know, sleep really is the platform for all of our physiological, emotional, and cognitive health. So that's how big it is. It's the platform, like the the foundation for everything. And if that foundation is off, all of those different areas of life are off. One of the reasons that sleep has escaped sort of our notice in a way and escaped the proper attention from medicine is that it includes pulmonology, cardiology, psychiatry, every area of our health, and these are all, of course, individual specialties, they're all profoundly foundationally supported by sleep or diminished by sleep. And that's one of the reasons that sleep medicine had to become its own discipline, and it's really a relatively new discipline. It's because it affects everything from blood sugar levels to heart rate to breathing. Um, Everything is affected. and, And then, of course, our emotional stability Sleep problems are a major cause of depression and anxiety, high blood pressure, difficulty with blood sugar regulation, obesity and overweight. I mean, it's so foundational for so many conditions. And that's why the message about that is if we address sleep, we're really addressing everything. Even immunity, uh, an important uh, note aside because of the pandemic, is that um, you know, a study that was just recently done in 2018 compared two groups of sleepers. One group identified themselves as always sleeping six hours or less. One group identified themselves as always consistently sleeping seven hours or more. That group had four times the resistance to infection as the group sleeping six hours or less. So this is also immunology. Our strength and activity and the vigorous nature of our uh, immune system is based on and supported by proper sleep. So it's huge. That is pretty amazing to think how powerful sleep or lack of sleep is. And uh, as you were listing all of the body systems and the areas that are affected by lack of sleep, I wanted to bring up because it comes to my mind uh, and the, the people that I often speak to in the Elder Care Illuminated podcast Uh, The research that has suggested that poor sleep is correlated with a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And so many people are caring for someone with a dementia right now. And so there's another thing to worry about. Any uh, adult son or daughter who has taken care of or is taking care of someone who has Alzheimer's is, of course, up at night worrying about their caregiver duties, and then worrying about whether they, in turn, will be developing Alzheimer's when they get older. What is the current thinking about those two areas, and uh, what can uh, allay some of our fears, or what can we do with that information? 
Well, there was a, you know, about five or six years ago, there was a, a system discovered called the glymphatic system. So it sounds like lymphatic, but it's glymphatic. And, and like the system of the lymphatic system that cleans out waste in the body, uh, like muscle waste, the glymphatic system cleans off the toxic plaque in the brain. And we know that it goes all day, except that in sleep, it actually is 20 times more vigorous in the way it cleanses the brain. So to any extent that we get less sleep than we need, we're not cleansing the brain the way it needs to be cleansed. So, you know, the good message is that mending your sleep and getting enough sleep, making it an absolute priority, that helps. Um, just to add on to that, how about the people who have turned to medications for helping with sleep? Are they truly helpful? Um, do they help that? lymphatic system do its job or is that just a band-aid that masks the problem it's kind of a band-aid it's a searching for a a too easy answer you know we look to pills for too much and if it weren't so easily affected in a positive way when you know how to do that then i would say yes but very seldom do people need medications in regard sleep it's 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 a shame that people do it and it and some of the medications are not providing the proper amount of sleep or the proper staging of sleep. For instance, uh, the glymphatic system is vigorous in stage three restorative sleep. <clears throat> and we should get about 20% of our night in stage three restorative our sleep. But a lot of people don't get that much. For different reasons, stress is one of them. We know that it diminishes the amount of that stage of sleep. Uh, and some of these medications may too. How? I'd be curious to know, how does the uh, amount of sleep that one needs, how does that differ by age? Well, we know that, you know, infants need 16 hours of sleep uh, up till about six uh, years old. In that three to six year, we're talking about 11 to 12 hours of sleep. Uh, Teenagers need 10 hours, nine to 10 hours of sleep. Only 18% are getting that. You know, when we talk about optimum sleep, we're really talking about how much sleep it takes to develop and behave normally. And so when we don't get enough sleep, we are not developing normally and we're not behaving normally. Uh, And so sleep for kids is an enormous issue and they're not getting nearly enough. Somehow we as adults have lost what a lot of our parents and grandparents had, which was kind of a strict sense of the absolute importance of sleep. You need to go to bed. You need to get your eight hours. We now know for adults, it's seven to nine. It really depends on the person. It's a pretty personal number. It's one of the things I have people do over the first couple of weeks is try to sense how much really makes you feel good and when does it start to make you feel depleted. And a lot of times people will say, you know, I think I've arrived at seven and a half works for me. Eight doesn't make it any better, but seven, I can feel it. It's not enough. Uh, A lot of people are in that seven, seven and a half, eight hours. One percent of the population are what we call genetic short sleepers and can get by on six hours or less. Only one percent. Everybody thinks that maybe they are the one percent, but probably they're not. (laughs) That's the trouble. People want to sleep less, which is just it's so sad that we've somehow arrived at this thought of, oh, it's such a waste of time. You know, I want to be doing and accomplishing and finishing tasks where we're oriented so on tasks and goals that we've lost our sense of the journey. And sleep is so rich with uh, enhancing and developing our, I call it our ontology, our sense of place in the universe. When in sleep, we plug into the universe. We plug into the collective unconscious. We plug into our own unconscious. And it's a really rich and important place to get as much as you can of, really. Yeah, you know, I'm always very interested in the differences that people have in sleep patterns. It's very common, actually, for people to have a really easy time falling asleep, but then they wake up around two or three in the morning and can't go back to sleep. And I've even heard theories that some people are maybe genetically built to sleep in like shorter shifts. Like, for example, um, two four-hour chunks with like an awake period in between. Yes, it's called bimodal sleep. And most of okay. us are mono, monomodal. Cats are polymodal. Parrots are also polymodal. No, mm-hmm. kidding. So we, most of us sleep in one big piece, but a lot of people want to sleep in two pieces. 
back when there was a lot more darkness and a lot less light, it was compelling. You know, it's 4.30 in the day, it's dark now. If we didn't have interior lighting, which we only had since 1890, you know, in the 300,000 years of human history, that's nothing. And so for almost all of human history at 4.30, this time of year, it's dark. And it's dark until about 6.30 in the morning. That's enormous. And mm-hmm. so people would, and they worked more physically. And so they probably went to bed around 8, slept till about 12, got up and did things for a couple of hours, went back to sleep and slept probably till eight, to about 6, 6.30. And that was normal to them. We do think that some people seem to be gen- genetically predispositioned to sleeping in two pieces. So when I see that in coaching, and I get a person to realize that this is actually not a problem. If we honor it, allow for that two hours, but don't spend those two hours on a screen of any kind, they're going to find that they get the eight hours probably over a 10-hour period, and it's wonderful. Sometimes as soon as they realize it's not a problem, it's okay, and it can, you can make it work, but just you know, from the field of chronobiology, we get a lot of these answers. What has affected our sleep? Why has it gone down so quickly and so much in the past 70 to 90 years? And it's because the introduction of artificial light. You know, human beings, our bodies tell time, not from a clock, but by the absence or presence of light. Light causes us to create certain kinds of hormones. It times the creation and the release. Darkness does the opposite. Human beings need about 12 hours of light. 12 hours of darkness but we get four to six hours more light than all our ancestors and four to six hours less darkness and it has caused havoc in our scheduling of sleep and our awareness of sleep because light makes your brain produce 15 different alerting chemicals that make you feel like thinking and being awake (laughs) and if it's 12 o'clock at night and you're getting that much light it will do it then too so it almost seems natural to stay awake. We just don't realize we're getting way, way too much light. Does it help to keep the house dim Absolutely. at night? Like, like just have the lights on, but dim them if you can? Right, that's what I tell people. You know, take a look at how much lighting you have. I think uh, up until you, the time we learn this, we think, well, the more light, the better, isn't it? But no, it isn't. So I tell people, you know, take a look. Obviously, have enough light so you're not tripping over things, but get all of your lights down. And then in the 60 to 90 minutes before you go to bed, that's the exact time that your pineal gland will make enough melatonin to get you through the night. Melatonin is interesting. It's an interesting hormone because it helps us to cool our core temperature. That's what you do when you fall asleep. So it doesn't really make you fall asleep. It's not a sleep aid, but it cools the core temperature so that you can sleep. And then it tells the brain to stop thinking, which is enormous. Most people go to bed uh, in that very time. They get the most light that they get all day because they're on a screen of some kind. And that's the most powerful light loaded with blue light, which actually can tell your pineal gland that it's noon and do not make any melatonin. It tells the other parts of your brain, continue to produce noontime thinking chemicals, and then we go to bed. So we go to bed where one sleep drive, it's called the homeostatic sleep drive, Take 16 hours to build. That's kind of an independent drive. So you can be really tired and sleepy. But in your brain, you can have the chemistry of noon. And most people we find is when they go to bed, they have a delayed circadian rhythm of about 90 minutes. So they may fall asleep, but in an hour and a half, they wake up with a brain full of thinking chemicals. And they can't believe when they look at the clock and think, gee, you only slept 90 minutes. How is it possible that I feel this awake and this alert and I can't possibly have gotten enough sleep? It's because the chemistry is so far off. It's incredible. You know, I often tell people, you know, that's a time when we often would like to get entertained. So people watch TV or they get on their computer or they game or they get on their phone. And I just say, in that period, turn on an audible book and turn the lights off or turn on a a podcast like this and learn something. But in the meantime, with the lights off, your brain is creating exactly the chemistry to coincide with your sleep drive so that you go to sleep with a brain with no thinking chemicals in it and just enough melatonin to continue that no thinking chemistry throughout the night. 
Rick, you mentioned circadian rhythms. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the circadian clock exists in all living things on this planet. Everything on this planet, from insects and plants to animals and humans, has an enormous system inside that's about the production of various kinds of chemicals, appetite chemicals, the chemical uh, leptin that actually helps us to control our appetite, 15 different thinking chemicals, blood pressure chemicals, lots of different things. And that, that production and release is timed by light and dark. Light does certain things, dark does other things, and also inhibits certain things. And so the circadian clock is that part of us that tells time only by light and dark. And obviously, because we can manipulate light and dark, we can get light at the absolute wrong time. We can also get dark at the wrong time. I don't want to demonize light. Light in the daytime is a wonderful thing. I tell people in the morning, get up in a black room that is so black, you can't see the furniture from your bed. That's the gold standard. But then as soon as you get out of bed, go into the room that's the brightest, have your first beverage of whatever you have in a bright, bright window, get all the sunlight you can, because that will turn on that circadian clock, make it vigorous in the morning so that it produces ghrelin, the one that makes you want to eat, get hungry. And then the 15 different chemicals that make you alert in all kinds of different ways so that through the day when you want to be alive and awake and thinking and functioning, it will be vigorous so that when the evening begins to come, it wants to slow down because it worked so well in the daytime. But if you have darkness and dimness in your work areas or in your house in the daytime, it isn't vigorous. That's why sometimes uh, you might get out, you might say on a Saturday, not that they're different anymore, but they used to be different. <laughs> and you didn't have to go to work, but you got up and it was rainy and dark. And then it's all of a sudden, it's 1030 in the morning. You think, my God, I can't wake up. What is going on? It's because there's not enough light. You really need that light in the daytime. At night, we need darkness and we need lots of it. And we're not getting it. What about napping? Oh, good. There was a good study done on napping. <laughs> Uh, it was a study done just recently, in, in fact, uh, in which um, we found that one or two 20 to 25 minute naps per week reduce cardiovascular risk by 48%. That's enormous. Isn't that incredible? Now, we sleep different than, say, Europeans uh, and people in Central and South America. It's just more cultural, though it can have to do with the amount of light and the amount of heat. But a lot of Europeans go to bed very late. They eat very late, they go to bed very late, but in the middle of the day, they shut the store and go home for a couple of hours and sometimes take over an hour nap, which here, by the way, would be too long. We recommend 20-minute naps, but it has more to do with the way we function. We tend to get up earlier here, go to bed earlier, and we're more monomodal. They're actually introducing a piece of bimodal by having some of their eight to nine hours be something that they catch during the day. So like a siesta is often an hour or more long. So napping is so, <laughs> a short is, a little bit of napping is good. What we found out, though, was that people who napped seven times a week in our culture, actually that actually was a symptom of bad sleep at night, that they actually had to do this because they weren't getting enough sleep at night. So it did not make them more healthy. Dr. Seisler at, uh, at the Brigham uh, did a study on napping in the daytime in the workplace, which is something that I, I try to promote with the companies that I work with. It's not an easy promotion, by the way. <laughs> a lot of resistance to it. And so what, we, what he found was that people who were, took a 20-minute nap in the, in the afternoon in that circadian window from 2 to 4, you know that period where all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, I could fall asleep if I put my head on the desk. That period is a very natural period because the circadian function steps back and produces less thinking and alerting chemicals just for a little while. And a lot of us get kind of tired. And on some days, you feel like you could take a nap. So what he found was that when people took a nap in the afternoon, a 20-minute nap, their productivity went up by 34% in the remainder of their day, and they were less likely to get in an automobile accident on the way home from work. And so napping in the daytime a little bit and a few times a week can be very productive and can actually protect your health. 
Well, I don't think that would be a tough sell at Torchlight. I think there are lots of us here <laughs> who would be willing to have people take the short afternoon nap. I think you may have partially answered this question already in your talk about um, keeping to a sleep schedule. But I, I want to point out for parents out there, and there are probably other people who do this as well, but it's particularly common in teenagers. People who try to make up for lost sleep on the weekends, they sleep too little all week long, and then they really, really sleep in on a Saturday or Sunday. Can you make up for lost sleep or is it just lost? You can get, you can make up somewhat, but not a lot. And the, the problem with the attempt to make up for the sleep is sometimes we begin to alter our sleep-wake schedule and we can create other sleep disorders like Sunday night insomnia. A lot of people have Sunday night insomnia. They'll say, you know, during the week, I'm okay, but Sunday night, it's terrible. I can't get to sleep. I'm restless. I get very anxious. Uh, and oftentimes that makes Monday kind of horrible and sometimes Tuesday because Sunday night was so bad. And this is a problem of scheduling. You want me to give you a quick explanation of it? Sure. Okay. So let's say a person gets up at six uh, in the morning on the weekdays and they go to bed at 10 at night. But then, and they do that every day except Friday, it's the weekend. And so people think, well, you know, <laughs> I don't have to go to work on Saturday. I can go out with my friends and see a band, have a few drinks, have a nice time, come home and go to bed at one. Who cares? And, you know, who would ever say anything? There's a problem with that. And uh, they go to bed and they sleep from one to eight, maybe, which is only seven hours. So they're not getting too much sleep. And then Saturday night, they do maybe something like the same and they go to bed around one o'clock in the morning. And they sleep until maybe 8 or 9 on Sunday. The trouble with that is you get up on Sunday at 9 instead of 6. Your sleep drive is not ready until 1 in the morning instead of 10. But people go to bed at 10 on Sunday night thinking, oh, boy, I better get uh, some sleep tonight because I've got to go to work tomorrow morning. And then they lay there for two, two and a half, three hours of sleeping a little bit and waking up and just and then it becomes sort of institutionalized. It really becomes an actually identifiable sleep disorder that happens every Sunday night. I always tell people there are two uh, solutions to that, and I won't even tell you the first one, but I will. I don't tell it to everybody because they won't do it. And the solution is go to bed and get up at the same time every morning, no matter if it's the weekend or not. So then they would say, you're right, I won't do that. So then I just say, do whatever you want on Friday night, do whatever you want on Saturday night. But on Sunday morning, get up at 6. Because at 10 o'clock, your sleep drive will be ready to work really vigorously. In fact, after what you did Friday night and Saturday night, it'll probably be ready about 8.30. And it's funny how people can tell me they've had this sleep problem for years. And they try this and within two weeks, it's gone. Wow. As long as they do this, either same time every day or get up at 6 o'clock on Sunday morning and make their sleep drive work properly instead of getting up at 9 or 9.30. Thank you. So uh, some people become sleep deprived as a result of their caregiving responsibilities. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be a result of parenting a very young child, uh, like a newborn. Anyone who's had a newborn knows what that's all about. Or your teenager, where um, I remember when my kids were <clears throat> old enough to be going out on their own in the evenings and like I did not really get into that good sleep until I heard the click of the door and knew that mm -hmm. all the chickies were back in the nest yeah. uh, and then of course if you're taking care of someone who has their own sleep challenges like a, a parent with Alzheimer's who if they live with you and, and more people are being reluctant to have somebody go into a residential facility during the pandemic but it is very typical for someone who has dementia to have either flipped their days and nights or to just oh, not be sleeping well. And so you can have your regular hours, but your sleep is disrupted repeatedly during the night, whether that's a newborn or somebody else getting up. So what can we do? Or is there any special advice if that's your life and you can't do anything about that? You know, I think that there's a good questions. It's a pretty complex question because those are all pretty different, even though they may seem similar. You know, so with a newborn, that's going to be over soon. But I always tell people, make sure as a couple, you know, if there are two people involved, that you share this. So that it isn't just the woman who gets up every night or isn't just the man who gets up every night, but it's one or the other. 
uh, and you share this kind of thing. I think it's also important to just make an overall rule for yourself. My sleep is absolutely essential. It's like food and water. I'm not going to do without it, even if I have to alter or take away from parts of my life elsewhere. So I just need to get my sleep. If it needs to be kind of bimodal, that can work. You don't even need to be genetically predisposed to it. But we've got to create the time that we need for our own sleep. And we need to help protect the sleep of the other. And also, I I warn people about shortcuts. Sometimes uh, people take a child or an infant into the bed with them. It doesn't work well. It's not good for their future sleep. Uh, don't rock them in their in your arms until they go to sleep, even though it seems like a shortcut, because they will actually become dependent on movement in order to sleep. And they will develop poor sleep habits throughout life. Sometimes we actually trace adult sleep problems back to childhood. Things like the parenting that was a little too strict, where every night was a fight. But now the person is 70 years old, and they're saying, but I still feel free and childlike when I stay up until two, you know? <laughs> because they're still rebelling against having to go to bed at eight o'clock some, you know, 65 years later. Uh, so, and so I always tell, you know, be, be really good, but careful that it doesn't become a combative fight every night, and that maybe even teach children about sleep. Um, the other thing is to, uh, don't take the shortcut of using light as a way of making someone feel safe. Light at night is dangerous because darkness protects us against cancer. Light actually takes away that protection. And so don't just have a night light because they feel safer. Try to use auditory soothing, singing a song, reading a story, talking from a distance near the door until they fall asleep, but not getting in bed with them or rocking them or touching them really because that become, they become dependent on that. Now, I'm sure that this is not as true for older adults or people with dementia. So, so this is really a broad, rich program. But I think for the caregiver, they just need to say to themselves, whoever I get the sleep I need, I've got to get it, even if it takes pieces in the daytime or has me bringing some help in at times so that I can get sleep. Because making myself sick over time is not going to help this person that I take care of. We really need, in every instance, to value sleep appropriately, which is almost in every case much more than we're valuing it now. Does that help? I think that is helpful. One of the last things you said does remind me of something about us here in our country where it's almost like it's bragging rights. I, I I only got three hours of sleep last night, or I don't need more than five hours of sleep, and I'm a dynamo. Right. But it's probably not true, is it, Rick? It probably isn't. You know, sometimes if you're 18 and you are more resilient than one can remember or imagine, <laughs> uh, and we heal from everything far quicker and come back from things like that, you know, yes, it sometimes can feel as though you really can abuse yourself that way. But generally speaking, there's a point where you realize that doesn't work. And maybe I shouldn't have done it then because I have maybe lasting injuries from overuse or that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think we just really need to get this message across to people that sleep is essential. And one of the proofs of it is something, Stephanie, that you said in your first opening line was that, you know, you didn't say it quite like this, but if you're 60, you've slept for 20 years in your life. If you're 90, you've slept for 30 years of your life. And that is not wasted time. We're built that way because that sleep is an essential, rich, powerful part of our life that makes us who we are, that connects us to things that we can't see and parts of ourselves that we're not always even aware of. When we lose that connection, we lose something very important about who we are as human beings and how we treat each other. So there are things about the value of sleep that are really invisible and hard to to sense, but they have to do with things like empathy and intuition, powerful parts of being a human being, and an an immune system that is still much more complex than we will ever understand. But it is so supported in so many ways by sleep that we need that sleep. So I I like the way you said, you know, a third of your life (laughs) is spent in sleep and it is for a purpose. Yeah, I love that. I know we're, we're getting short on time. I think that as we wrap this up, I want to ask, what about plain old stress? You know, there's so much of that going around yep. right now, especially. What suggestions do you have to help people sleep even though they ha- go to bed 
feeling very stressed about whatever's going on in the world, in their life. It's hard to stop worrying. So there are, there are two presentations that I give to corporations. One is called uh, Deep Relaxation for Better Sleep. And so it teaches relaxation strategies and techniques and breathing techniques that help people get more relaxed and thus get more of that restorative sleep. And there's a new one that I have. It's called Finding Sleep, Peace, and Immunity During Challenging Times. And in that, I talk about a lot of the things I've talked about, how all of a sudden you change your schedule and didn't realize it. And part of it actually was kind of neat, but then part of it didn't work. And I do uh, a guided relaxation. I teach people ways of mindfulness, ways of being present, just little exercises like the importance of of breathing in and out through the nose, kind of getting rid of mouth breathing, which is actually not the way we were built to breathe. And it makes a big difference. People begin breathing less times per minute. They begin to trigger the relaxation uh, response, which is really important. And I think this is more important than it has ever been because of the amount of stress that we're under. And so anything you can do to relax, whether it's uh, watch a fun movie or a comedy, listen to a relaxation recording. When I coach people for sleep, I email them a recording called Better Sleep that has involves my voice and a guided meditation around sleep. And it's a huge piece of how they get better. Podcasts like this. Uh, Audible books are wonderful. It's like having your mom sit there and read you a story. And you can have the lights off and you you don't make it that far usually. But it's a great way to manage stress, initiate sleep, and deepen things. But I remind people stress is important. When we talk about the way stress and sleep impact companies, uh, insufficient sleep costs American corporations $136 billion a year. And stress costs them $300 billion. So those two markers or two conditions are the most impacting on our workforce, which is most of us. And so when we address those, we address the foundation of everything else. So important and really fascinating for sure. Well, Rick, thank you so much for being here today. You've given us so much to consider. It's really been helpful for me to hear all of this, and I I believe it will be for our listeners as well. For those of you listening, if you'd like to learn more about getting a good night's rest and want a few additional tips, and you have a Torchlight account, I encourage you to check out tips to help your child get a better night's sleep and 12 ways to get a better night sleep if you have a child account or the uh, two e-guides called sleep problems yours and sleep problems your loved ones uh, if you have a torchlight Mm -hmm. elder account if you'd like to learn more about rick and his work you can find him on his website at clearmindsystems.net that is it for now thank you all so much for listening and we will see you next time Thanks for listening to Elder Care Illuminated, a Torchlight Caregiving Podcast. Find other episodes of Elder Care Illuminated on iTunes, Spreaker, and Podcast Go. If you're interested in bringing Torchlight Elder or any of Torchlight's other caregiving products to your workplace, please contact info at torchlight.care. That's info at T-O-R-C-H-L-I-G-H-T dot C-A-R-E.